You have to wait for that one, although they're already on the website too, but that's because they don't want you to cheat and get to the challenges ahead of time, because there are challenges involved. I got prizes, candy, good sugar to get you going through the day. Um, couple more for, for me, uh, all my resources and stuff, everything pretty much can be found on my website, donovanscience.com. Also, if you want to listen to me a little bit more, I'm on the Friendly Disruption Podcast. We're going to do our podcast this afternoon. We talk about accessibility, universal design, learning, a lot of stuff like that. That's actually, accessibility is the topic of my other session this afternoon, or later today, like 11.15, I think. The next main session after the keynote. Uh, also running for the iTech board, vote for me. Not above shameless self-promotion, just saying that. So, vote, yeah, anyways. Um, I get called a wizard a lot because there's stuff I will do with Google Sheets. Uh, you know, we were in a meeting last week talking about students and we were worried about attendance data, about kids who had more than eight unexcused absences. Now, of course, you get the question like, well, I wonder how many kids that is. Because we have 1,400 students in our building, so that could be a good number of kids. And I don't like unknowns. So all I did right then and there is I pulled the data from Infinite Campus and then I figured out how many kids have eight or more unexcused absences in any class. And I put the list up on the TV, because it was that easy. It took me a couple minutes. And the thing is, the stuff I did with that is just using the simple equations I'm going to show you now. There's some stuff that you can do with a little bit more advanced equations. Um, I typically put blog posts on my blog when I do those. Like, I got two more blog posts coming out this week. One will compare two lists and auto-populate a third list of who's missing from those two lists. So if you have like a master list of people who have turned something in, you get a third sheet that'll tell you in an auto-populate who hasn't done it yet. That one, that teacher asked me how to do that. I'm like, I don't know. We'll figure that out. And we did, and it's awesome. Uh, a couple other things. Now, of course, I had to put this up there because originally this was kind of like Harry Potter themed. I didn't like that after a while, so it kind of changed a little bit. But, of course, I had to leave this up because, you know, his name, right? Patrick, that's my name, too. My son loves that fact. I don't. But anyways, um, data really should be driving a lot of things. See, I, my background is physics. That's what I got my degree in. That's what I taught high school science for nine years. I don't like going off my gut, okay? Unless your name is Leroy Jethro Gibbs. If you watch NCS, you know what I'm talking about. Don't trust your gut, you need to trust data. You need actual values to tell you stuff. Um, so data really should be driving kind of everything we're doing. Instructional practices, building instructional decisions, everything. We shouldn't be making decisions because I have a hunch or something like that. If we have data available to us, we need to grab that. And that's just something I think we need to be able to do. And so that's why I get called a wizard a lot because we'll ask these questions and I'm going to answer them with the data we have. Like, how many kids are failing each class? Where's our highest risk area? Every three weeks we put out grades. And so what I do is I play with those grades and I can tell exactly right away what our top classes with Fs, what our top classes percentage-wise with Fs, what our top classes with Fs with students that have less than three absences. All that we can figure out quickly just using some simple equations. Uh, so if you go to this link right now, this is going to force you to make a copy. And this is what you're going to need to participate in the challenges today, but this is also some fake data. And so if you go to sheets, bit.ly slash sheetsmagic, all lowercase, you'll get a spreadsheet that's going to force you to make a copy, and you'll have fake data to play with. We're going to play with the same fake data, because it, you can't sit and listen to this. It's not a sit and get. You have to play with it. And I guarantee you that unless you practice with these equations or you have actual reason to use them, you're going to forget them, but luckily you'll have this spreadsheet you can go back to. And just so you know, on my blog, I do have videos going through pretty much every one of these equations. So if you forget what you're doing, try to find a video on my blog on my YouTube. You can also tweet at me. I will answer your questions. I try to answer the questions posted to YouTube, but some people have really weird questions. I have no idea how to answer them. So, everybody got this? It's Sheets Magic after bit.ly. I love my bit.ly's. I'm going to do that too. Slash Sheets Magic. All right. Hey, look at that. Forcing me to make a copy. Gotta love that. I'm just going to throw it over here. And the reason why is just so we have all the kind of fake data to play with. There we go. All right. So these are the top equations I'm going to kind of tell you how to use or help you use. Really, like, this is like 98% of everything I do on Google Sheets is with these equations. That's it. And the thing is that some of them are very simple ones. Some of them have very specific details you have to pay attention to. Some of them aren't even equations that conditional formatting is not. 
And then there's ones that are just confusing like array formula, but it's very useful, especially when some add-ons don't work. Now, if you are ever using data from Google Forms, this is, I have to say this because this is where people run into trouble all the time. So if you're using data from Google Form, please know that every time somebody submits that form, they're creating a brand new row in that spreadsheet. That row did not exist before somebody entered that form. So let's say the data comes in here. You have your first row, which is name of your questions, timestamps, all that fun stuff. Then you have where your data goes. After you get data into a spreadsheet from the Google form, you can add a row above it and do stuff up there. You can also add stuff to the right side. Ooh, almost tripped, that would've been fun. To the right side of your data after it's in. But here's the thing, every time somebody submits that form, a new row is created. So you actually can't pre-populate information on the right side for data that's gonna come in, unless you're using some called an array formula. But there's also other ways to get around it. But just know that what I typically tell people, if you're using data from a Google form spreadsheet, don't mess with the raw data. Open a new tab, a new sheet, and mess with it over there. There's a lot of easy ways to do it. And that's just gonna make your life so much easier. Never mess with that data, that first sheet that all the data goes to. Use another sheet to mess with it, and I'll show you how. Um, so let's talk about some scenarios. Let's say I wanna identify high-low scores of student data. Simple thing a lot of people probably need to do. One way you can do this is with conditional formatting. Conditional formatting is just where we're gonna tell the cells what color to be based on the data in that cell. So you can do this even ahead of time and copy and paste data and then easily see, all right, where are my high scores, where are my low scores? And you kind of see that little background image. Okay, you can't see it, guess not. We'll just show you in real life. So if we go to that fake data, and let's say, you see I did kind of alternating colors here. I like that feature. Uh, but let's say I want to know where in that data for let's say quiz one, two, three, test, all that, where are those scores that are high and where are those scores that are low? To do this, I'm gonna zoom in a little bit more. You select the data, the cells you want to apply the conditional formatting to. So this is the basic stuff. Click kind of the upper left part of the cells you want. So I want that first cell here. And I want it to go all the way to this 100 here. I just click that top one, I'm gonna hold down shift, and then click that. So that selects all the cells. So again, I feel like I need to say that again. I select this top one, I just click it, take my hands off the keyboard. I'm gonna to go to that bottom left and hold down shift and click again. That will select all those cells. So now I'm gonna right click. Oh, let's right click somewhere else. Here we go. And you see I get these options. If I go down here, I'm gonna see conditional formatting. That's down here at the bottom, <coughs> second to the bottom. And now what's going to do, and I guess i got to zoom out a little bit, is it's going to show me the range that's from E2 to H21 that's going to apply this. I'm going to tell it that, and you see I have a lot of options here, and let's say I want to do it if the value is greater than something. So you have greater than, I have greater than or equal to, I have less than. For those of you who didn't really get that in math class, I'm sorry, it's you know this or this. I'm going to do greater than or equal to, let's say, 90. That's what our typical like A type percentage. And green sounds good to me. Green is good for an A, right? And I can click done. And you can see some of those cells became green. I can even add a new rule to that area. And I'm going to go and say less than, let's say, 70. But I don't want this to be green. I'm going to want this to be red. And you can see that I can actually like pick many different colors. Like we can go really red, or I can make it any color I want. So if I hit done, I'm gonna zoom out for a second. I can X this just to make it go away. So now you can see those scores. Although you can't really see my numbers, you'll hopefully be able to see it on your screen. I can quickly see where my low scores are and where my high scores are. And sometimes just making that data visual can help me make some very quick decisions. So that's conditional formatting. There's a lot of different things you can do it for. You can even say if it contains a certain word, you can make it turn a different color. Uh, and if you really get fancy, you can write custom equations to tell it what to do. I don't do that very often, though. That's the basic way. So what questions do we have over that? So I don't want to lose you after each step. And again, I have stuff online if you get lost, but hopefully you don't. All right, so conditional formatting, 
useful because again, it helps in data as visual. Most people can't look at numbers and come to conclusions quickly by just seeing the actual numbers. You want a simplification like a graph or in this case, colors. And if you're colorblind, you can pick different colors. That's pretty much what I'm going to say on that one. Or there's a Chrome extension that'll do that for you too. Just get that later. Sort and filter are two equations that we can use to actually sort the data. So yeah, I can sort the data the easy way. But remember what I said earlier about Google Forms? I never mess with my raw data. Typically, I do that with anything. I pull data a lot from Infinite Campus. That's our you know, attendance gradebook program, which is great with data. It's horrible everywhere else, but I'm just going to say. Um, and I pull all that raw data out to one tab, and then I leave it alone. So I can always go back to it. I always mess with everything on a separate tab. So if I look at my data like right now, let's go back to my fake data. And if you go to the top of any column, you see how there's a little down arrow there? I'll zoom in a little bit more. Whoops. No, no, no. There we go. Sorry. Bad fingers today. I can click that, and you can see one thing it says down here is I can sort it. And that's the only way you can do it. Now, did anybody, if you look up here, you see how I have like a really dark gray line there? I'm freezing that top row. Originally, when you have any spreadsheet open, you're going to see these two dark lines here in the corner. You can grab one of those and pull it down. And what that means is that if I were to keep scrolling down, that row stays there. And I can do the same thing with this guy here. I can freeze a column, which means that even if I keep scrolling to the right, that column stays there. But that also won't be affected by a simple sort if I just do that. So that's good. I like that. So if I go right now, I'm going to go back to that E, and I have a little drop down. I'm going to go down to sort. I can sort it Z to A, which is, you know, descending. So I'll put my top score at the top, and we can see it like that. So that's how you can sort without an equation. But again, I don't like messing with my raw data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a second sheet. And so anytime you need to create a new sheet, just click the plus sign down here. You'll see a brand new sheet here. You can even rename it if you want. I'm going to name mine sort and filter. I like to name my tabs. Kind of like my docs, I have to name them too so I know what the heck is on that. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a spreadsheet with all these sheet one, sheet two, sheet three, sheet four. And that's no fun. All right, so what I'm going to do is I want bug apparently to attack me. Uh, I'm going to select my cells because I want this information. So again, same thing I did before. I click the first cell I want, hold down shift, click the last cell. And I'm just going to copy that so I get that same header on that side. And I just paste it into that first cell. What I want now is I want to sort the data I had before according to, let's say, grade level, because I had that in my data. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the sort equation. So I'll pull the data from the other sheet to this sheet and sort it based on whatever I tell it to. So I click equal, and that's how you enter your equations, if you didn't know that, sort. And here's the thing, Google Sheets will always try to help you. If you start typing an equation, it'll give you the possibilities. And there, once I put in the uh, parentheses, you see that it'll actually give me the help here. If you don't see that, there's a little question mark, click the question mark. I use the cheat sheet all the time, okay? Because sometimes I forget what goes when. Like in this first part here, it says range. Now. This is the thing that's going to make your life simple. Never feel like you have to type that out. I'm going to go back to you kind of see how it's still there. It's kind of just hovering because I'm still in that equation mode. I can click and drag the area of data I want to pull in. So I'm going to sort all the information. So I want to grab it all. And I can't actually get my cursor below that. I want to start at A2, but I can't. So that's all right. We'll just go down to A3. So I'm going to click and drag. And I can go all the way down to the data I want. And you can see how it said the main data, that's the name of the tab, from A3 to H21. Well, I actually wanted H2, so I can actually click in there and change that. And you know, here's the thing. I want to pull in all that data. Make life easier on you. Get rid of that second set of numbers. Because what it's going to do is it's going to pull from A2 all the way to the bottom of H. Which is nice because what if you pull in more information? You don't have to go back and say, well, now instead of row 21, I have to go to row 22. No, you can just say go all the way to the bottom. It'll keep 
applying the equation to the bottom. All right, now I hit comma. Now it says sort column. What's that asking me is, since I picked column A to be my first column, how many columns over is my sorting criteria? Pretty much this is where you count. I count my fingers a lot when I don't know the alphabet in my head. Uh, I want to go to D. So from A to D, well, that's A, B, C, D. That's four. So it's my fourth column I'm going to sort by. Because we're going to do by grades. Again, comma. And then here's where you see true or false. True is ascending. False is descending. And it tells me that in there, too. So don't get confused. So I'm going to say true. Uh, and that's it. I can just close it now. Close parentheses. Enter. And you'll see it's sorted by grade level. Now, that was fun. Now, you see it didn't copy over any conditional formatting. Conditional formatting stays on that page. It's just copied over the data, just so we're aware of that one. Now, I can go back to that equation, and I can sort by different columns. So let's say I wanted to go by quiz one. Well, that was column E, so A, B, C, D, E, that's five. And now it'll resort according to that. So the sort equation is nice because I can keep changing it. So I can go back to that equation, and I can even say, you know, let's go by this column instead. It's a static descending. Now, one thing I'll tell you is kind of fun. Trust me, it's fun. And then sometimes what I'll do is I'll put all this stuff like two rows down. And the reason why is because I'll have like a row up here, and I'll say sort column, and I'll change the number. Because what I can do is I can quickly change that number. And if I say instead of 5, I reference the cell that I'm going to keep changing the number of. I can actually make it go and change all the time. Okay, that seems a little confusing, so maybe I'll go back on that one. But there are ways that you can actually set this up ahead of time. So instead of having to change the equation, you change one cell, and it will change the whole equation. And I do this a lot with our teachers. So we had to one time, uh, what was it? Uh, probably F list, if I can remember correctly. We had to share the information with them, and I wanted them just to find their information. So I had it so they could pull their name from the drop down, and then as soon as they selected their name, it changed what was in the equation, so it only showed them their information. And so I just gave them a spreadsheet like I do with you guys. They make a copy, choose their name from drop down, all their data shows up. So I didn't have to make 80 plus spreadsheets. I made one spreadsheet and let them make their own copy. So they get their own individual by changing one cell. It was kind of nice. So that's a sort function. Now, I'm going to go back to that equation just for a second. Because you saw that if I put another comma in there, I can sort by multiple criteria. I can sort first by grade level, and then maybe that first score, and then maybe the third score. And it'll do that for you. So know that you can have multiple sort criteria in there. So typically the first one is going to be the main sort, and then you're going to sort inside of that with the second one. Then you can even sort inside of that. So this can get very confusing very quickly if you keep going on that, but that's a nice thing. Now, let's say I didn't want to look at all those grade levels, though. Let's say I only wanted to look at 10th graders, because I have multiple grade levels in here. Well, for that one, I would have to filter out the information, right? And that's the equation. We're going to filter. So I'm going to actually delete that equation for a second. And now I'm going to use the filter equation. So a filter allows me to only look for information that matches a certain criteria. So if I equal filter, again, Google's nice in telling me what I'm looking for. And then it gives me a little cheat sheet. And again, it's the range. Again, I'm not going to type it in. I'm going to select it. I'm going to do the same thing I kind of did before. You know what? I'm not even going to have to go all the way to the bottom. Because I'm going to do the same thing I did last time. I'm just going to get rid of that number at the end. So it goes all the way to the bottom. And then remember my little cheat sheet, as nice as it is, it keeps blocking cell A2, so I just need to go A2 all the way to the bottom of H. All right, so that's how I select my range. Everybody, we've done that a couple times now, did everybody get that? That's kind of important, yes? If you start in the bottom of your range and drag it up, it's really easy. Yep. Yeah. I just, I have gotten so used to just having it block that, I think I always, that's why my mind thinks upper left to lower right, upper left to lower right. Um, let's see. So now I want to put my condition. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select, I want the grade to only equal 10th grade, right? That's my sophomore. So I'm going to select D2, drag down. Now here's the thing. This equation, like many equations, 
is going to ask me to make sure that I have the same number of rows in my initial data and my end data. So the case of here where, let's say I only went down to H10, then I'd have to have D10. If I went to H21, I'd have to have D21. Since I'm going down to H, I'm just going to go down to D. All right? And if you look at my little cheat sheet here, now I get the right kind of mathematical equation. And it's going to be equal to, and since this is a number, I'm just going to put 10. So again, I'm just using that cheat sheet. So it's going to filter that data with only data in this column equal to 10. And if I hit enter, whoops, you can see it did that. Now here's the thing. Let's say I was looking for a word and not a value. So if I'm looking for a number, I just write out the number. If you're looking for a word, you have to put that in, you know, quotation marks. And then write the word. It has to be kind of exact. There are ways you can do it where it's not exact. And I can tell you that later, but we're not going to cover that now. But if you're looking for a word, it has to be in quotation marks. If you're looking for a value, a number, it's just the number. And we're going to the equation one more time. Because... Again, you see that it can actually filter based on multiple criteria. So let's say I only want 10th graders with a value greater than 90. It would filter that. So this is helpful because, again, sometimes you're dealing with a large amount of data. You need to make it smaller. And like I pull out all six-week grade reports for 1,400 students for every course they're in. I need to filter that stuff when I'm looking for it. So, I'm just going to close that. Again, close parentheses. Uh, Google Sheets will also tell you if you have in, you know, don't have the same number of parentheses. All right, we're going to hit enter on that one. Now, one last thing I'm going to teach you on this one before we get to our first little challenge is you can combine equations. That is the nice little thing about this is that I can take that equation. So this filter is already taking that big data set to a small data set. Let's say I want to sort that data. Well, I can go in front of the word filter and I'll type the word sort. Put it in the parentheses. That's not me beeping. All right. And what I have to do instead here is I'm going to put a comma. So I'm sorting. That's my range now. That filter equation is now my range. And so I'm going to sort by column E. That's letter 5. And let's do <coughs> descending. So that's false. So all I did is I took that filter equation I had before. It replaced the range. So now I'm going to sort that data. And when I go enter, it works. Don't worry, if you screw up, it's going to tell you. Then you have to figure out why. Um, so I'm going to go back to that just for a second. So that filter data, so this whole part here is just the range. So that's kind of where that took place. So you can do an equation inside an equation, inside an equation, inside an equation. You can keep kind of like the Russian nesting dolls with equations, pretty much. Um, and that's nice, because then I can sort and filter at the same time. We good? All right, we'll see how good we are. All right, let's go back to my little spreadsheet for a second. Because, <laughs> now we're going to do a challenge. We're going to see how good you guys are paying attention, see how well you're doing so far. I got a feeling we're not going to get to challenge number three. Maybe I'll leave that one on Twitter, and I'll find me for the last candy prize. All right, so I'm going to give you another data sheet here, and you're going to have to do some of that data. We're going to see how good you were paying attention, because you got to practice it, like I said. So if you go to bit.ly sheets wizard one, see I'm very creative with my short links, right? Sheets wizard one. I got a question for you. What students were in the top three for the test one score, but were also in group B for activity one? And you'll know what I'm talking about once you look at that data. So we're going to see how far we can get with this. We might have to actually lead the other two challenges to a Twitter challenge. If you're not on Twitter, you can at least find me. I'm around. I'm easy to spot. So if you go to that link, that's going to force you to make a copy, hopefully, if I didn't screw that up. It happens like 50% of the time. Um, and let's see if you can do that with that data. Because we're learning this. Now, you don't have to participate. If you don't want to, I got candy. You get your choice. I even stopped at the gas station this morning to make sure, because I normally forget. Let's see what we got. You got Skittles, or Twix, or M&M's, they're in here somewhere. Your choice if you want to win. But we'll see who can come up with the answer the first. 
So which students are in the top three for test one score, but are also group B for activity one? If I was mean, I probably would have made there a lot more data. So I'm gonna click on my sheet here. Again, so make me make a copy. I'm not gonna tell you the answer, you guys have to tell me the answer. I know, 8 a.m. on Monday, you got it? Do you want me to put it in? Oh, no, you can just share it. Sorry, what was that? Full Valley Mondell, Hunt, or Miles Hunt, and then Mondell Sample. Okay, let's see. Yeah, that works. All right, so I know that was kind of quick. So you guys may have got pretty much the equation was similar to what I just did right there. There's a sort and a filter. I, I just highlighted the cell so I would know the answers too, because I had to make sure my equations worked. Apparently, I tried this last night, and challenge number three was too tough, so I didn't do it. You got to use your challenge. All right, so here's the thing. You're going to have that spreadsheet, uh, the link to my slides in a bit. If you want to practice with those, if you have any questions on this, tweet at me, email me. Again, my name is Diamond Science on Twitter, Instagram, Gmail, blog, everything. Not going to tell you what it is on Snapchat. All right, so. We're going to kind of go forward a little bit, but you have that practice if you want it. you got to practice Google Sheets stuff. It's the only way you really learn, trust me. The only way I know all the stuff I do know is because I practice a whole lot. I get bored sometimes of things I can't solve. Sheets is something I can solve. It's kind of like my little stress relief. That sounds strange, but that's okay. I have a degree in physics. It's normal for my people. All right, so let's say I want to compare test one scores to test two scores. And this is kind of where you get to the case of where I have data on one sheet and I have data on another sheet and I need those two sheets to talk. And so we can use an equation called VLOOKUP. And you can't tell by the image, we're looking up at a building. Which is weird because you actually go down on a VLOOKUP. I don't understand that myself, but that's how it works. Um, this is by far one of my favorite equations to use. But in order to use this, you do have to have a unique value. So let's go back to here. So if you notice on my main data, no, no, okay, get rid of that. If you look at my main data, I have the student ID. You have to sometimes have very unique <coughs> values to work with a VLOOKUP. If you have student IDs in your data, awesome. If not, you can create a unique value, but it's typically not going to be first name or last name. Because if you're like my school, we have a lot of kids with the same first name because that happens way too often, and there's solved some five Mitchells in one class. It's not confusing at all. Um, so if you have your student ID, that's great. Something unique. If you have something unique with your data set, like say email address, you can use VLOOKUP very easily. If not, I'm gonna show you in a second how to create a unique value. But let's say here, I have test one score. Let's say I want to bring the test two score, but that's on a totally separate sheet. Now I could take the time to just look for, okay, Kyra got in 55, I'll type it in over there. I don't got that kind of time. So instead we're gonna use VLOOKUP. So I'm gonna just type test two up here, so I know what my column is. And here's my equation, equals VLOOKUP. And again, you can see it already knows I'm looking for VLOOKUP. It's called vertical lookup. It actually looks down, but that's okay. Parentheses, and again, here's my cheat sheet. Search key is a unique value. A unique value has to be in the first column of the data you're searching. I say that again. It has to start with the unique value, and that unique value has to be in the first column. Because what this equation is going to do is it's going to go down that column until it finds that unique value, then it's going to go over as far as you tell it to and pull that data. So the way this is going to work. I wanted to find this student ID for Armanda. This was made using a random name generator, by the way. I have no idea if I've ever seen Armanda before. And then we do comma. Then it's the range again. Well, I'm looking at the test two scores tab. And here's where, again, remember how I said that I can just get rid of that E10? I'm also going to get rid of the A2. I'm going to tell you why in just a second. I'm just going to get rid of the two. So I want to look from the top of A to the bottom of E. That's what that will tell me to do. I don't need to start at A2. I can start anywhere in A. 
then comma. This index says how many columns over am I going to pull that value? So pretty much test score is in column E. A, B, C, D, E. Okay, five. Now let's say I started by column B. Then I'd do B, C, D, E, and that'd be a four. So it's just how many columns over it's looking. Now here's the weird thing. Just type in the word false. It's not ascending, descending now. Um, for V lookup would also, this is, I've never seen an actual reason why I'd ever use true in this. Because if you write true, if it doesn't find a unique value, it's going to go down to the next possible number. So if you can't find a thousand, it's going to look for a thousand and one. Why it does that, I have no idea. We're going to say false. You're almost always going to use false. Now I'm going to hit enter. <coughs> awesome. It said Armanda got a 27 on that. Now I can double check. Let's find Armanda in here. There's Armanda. She got 27. So it worked. Now, I do not have to retype that equation for every student in this data set. That would be silly. So I need that equation to happen for everybody. So there are two ways to do this. You see how there's a little box here in the bottom of that cell? I can just click that box and drag it down. And it'll copy that equation down to those cells. Now, if you remember correctly, this one was looking at student ID found in A2. When I copied it down to the next row, it's now looking at A3. So as you copy down that equation, it's going to go the next row down in any value in that equation. So the next one down, it went to A4, then A5, A6. And that works exactly because that's the value I want to look for. This is why I got rid of the, in the range, I got rid of those numbers here. Because if I were left as A2 to E, let's do that right now. I might delete these, so I don't need those anymore. So let's say I'm going to left this one as A2 to E. If I copy this down one row, it's now going to search A3 to E, which means it's missing that whole first row of data I want it to look for. What if the data I wanted was in that first row? So now you're going to get a lot of these not applicable error messages. So that's why you always, like, when you're doing something like this, where you're copying down the equation, in the ranges, get rid of those numbers. Just look for that whole thing. I need the A2 because that's the specific cell. It's looking for that student ID in my whole column. So I need that to always leave that there. Now, let me show you one fun little thing. And then we got to get down to the next equation because apparently I'm going slow. All right. So I can click and drag that to copy it down, or I can double click it. And it automatically copies down my data for every row that there's information. So now I can see who got a test one, what score they got in that test two. I can use conditional formatting to see if they match up and stuff like that. So VLOOKUP is by far my number one equation I use. It is very, very useful. All right, I'm going to stop here for more questions because that is a big equation. And I feel like if I don't get to the others, at least I need to get to that equation. Good? Awesome. All right, so VLOOKUP is very useful. Whoops, helps me do that. And if you don't have a unique value, you can create one. And I use the equation called concatenate to do this. Concatenate combines values to make a new one. Now, sum adds up numbers to do that. You know, it just adds up numbers. I can also just add numbers by saying, add this number, this cell, and this cell, and give me a new number. Or I can sum a whole range of cells. But what concatenate does is it combines, like, values, whether they're numerical or letters, to make a new cell. So in the case of this, let's say I didn't have a student ID number, a unique value. I could create one. So let's say, oops, I'm going to go over here. I might enter a new column. So I, to enter a new column, you just click the like C, that'll select that whole column. Right click, and I can insert a column to the right. All right. Oh, and here's the nice thing. If you go back to insert columns or columns into your sheets, and you had equations pulling data from that sheet, all those other equations are going to adjust themselves automatically. That is a nice feature. All right, so we're going to say this unique name. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to combine the first name, last name, so I have a unique value. So again, equals. My equation is concatenate. See, look at that, concatenate. 
All right, so string one is the first part. So I want to take the last name, and I have to take comma, and then I want to add the second name. But I want a comma there too. Here's the problem, I can't just put a comma, because a comma separates the things it's connecting. So I'm gonna use quotation mark, comma, quotation mark. So what it's gonna do, it's gonna combine what's ever in C2 with a comma now. If I didn't put those quotation marks around that comma, it would add that comma. It can't add a comma if I don't add it. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm going to put another comma because the third thing I wanted to add is the first name. Oop, there we go. And you see how they made that. I highly doubt any of your students have exactly the first name, last name. Actually, we do in our school, and I really hate that. But hopefully yours don't. And then you can do the same thing here. Double tap, copies all the way down. Hopefully then I have unique value. So this is a case where if you do not have like a student ID or email address and you need to create a unique value so you can do a VLOOKUP, concatenate will combine it. And if you go back to that little, and I really, seems like I'm saying myself multiple times, you need to put, if you want to add in a punctuation, it has to be in quotation marks. Let's say I want to add a space. How do you think I would do that? Yeah, so I can put a comma here, quote, space, quote, there we go. And now it will do that. Because some people can't stand there being no space between that and some can, so. Concatenate can do multiple things. It's how we can actually, if you, like, our email addresses are their student ID and the first three letters of the last name. And there have been times where I didn't pull out the correct ones, I had to just say the first three letters of the last name. What? Well, I can't hear the question, sorry. Yep, yep. Here you go. Um, so you can concatenate multiple things. Now, here's an equation I'm not going to get to yet. It's called left or right. What it'll do is it'll pull in, like, say, you have somebody with a really long name. Now I need the first three letters. I can say left, that name, three. And it'll pull the three first letters from the left. I can do the same thing with right, but that just seems weird on the name. So to go from the left. But, so that's the equation we won't get to today, but it is an option in there. All right, I am so not going fast enough. That's okay, I'd rather you guys learn. See, it's about depth, not breadth. Width. Right, right. Plus, you have videos on my e website for me to see this. Um, sum and A plus one, you can just see equals sum and say the columns. And A1 plus B1, you can actually just say equals this cell plus this cell, and it'll do the math for you. Pretty much, it'll do any math you want. So like, if I want to figure out percentage, I'll say this divided by this, give me a value. Uh, and one thing you can do with that is know that if under format, number, oops, there we go, you can say what you want. So if you want it to show up as a percent, you can tell it to show up as a percent. I oftentimes go down to like, like I don't like that number. Uh, any science teachers in the room or math teachers? All right. It's called this value called significant figures. It's kind of like how many numbers after the decimal point usually is it's, it's more complex than that. but. I only typically want one. And you can find a format that will give you just one. So if you don't like how your number is displayed, you can change it. All right. We're going to skip the second challenge, but if you want to, tweet at me later. First person to find me with the right answer will get the answer to the good candy.